former jockey, exercise rider, and trainer on the East Coast. She transitioned into television as the analyst for the Maryland Jockey Club. Her career at ESPN started as a studio analyst for the National Best 7 and Today at the Races, and she then branched out into sideline reporting for college football and eventually became a general assignment reporter on SportsCenter. She's won three Eclipse Awards and has been nominated for two Emmys, and she's one of the most pleasant souls I've ever come across in horse racing. In the spotlight, it's Janine Edwards, and Janine, thanks for sharing some time. Oh, that's sweet, Joe. Thanks so much for having me on. Well, Janine, usually you're the one that's uh, doing the interviewing. What does it feel like to be on the other side of the questions? Oh, I got to tell you, it's a little unnerving. It really is. And I and this is my first Skype, everybody. I've never Skyped anybody in my life. And I keep wanting to look down at the computer screen rather than at the camera. You would think I would know how to look at the camera lens. But yeah, well, I'm working with a makeshift um, teleprompter here, so I know exactly what you're talking about. Hey, we don't use prompters in my world. You're cheating. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're off to a rousing start in this interview. Uh, Jeannie, it's been quite a journey for you. Take us back to the early days. How did you get your initial interest in uh, in horse racing and uh, horses themselves? Oh, gosh. I, I loved horses as long as I can remember, even as a very little girl. I'm, I'm talking little, little, like three, four, um, wanting to go for pony rides and just being fascinated with horses. And... I think I was really bitten by the horse racing bug when I was 12 and Steve Cawthon won the Triple Crown on Affirmed. And, you know, you can remember watching those thrilling Derby, Preakness, and Belmonts with Affirmed and Alidar, and I was just hooked. And I had already had a love and a passion for riding and never had my own horse, but um, my mom and dad would, you know, let us go for horseback riding lessons and jumping lessons and things like that. And... So I decided that I wanted to work with racehorses and work on the track. And first I wanted to be a jockey, but as you guys know, I'm tall. So the weight was an issue. It was hard for me to um, be a 10 pound bug. So I only rode in a, in a handful of races, but um, it evolved into, an, you know, being an exercise rider, uh, assistant trainer, and then eventually training for about three years on my own. And what about the transition then? Because obviously you uh, you went into television at a certain point. Why did you decide to give up on the backstretch career and uh, talk in front of a television camera and discuss your views on racing in that way? Well, it was nothing that I really had any um, interest in ever doing. I thought I would make a career out of you know training racehorses, but as we all know, it's a tough way to make a living. And, you know, horses are very delicate and fragile, and you need a lot of stock, and you need good stock. So I think the time was just right. At that point in time in my career, um, I got married. Um, my first marriage was to uh, Jim Edwards, who was a jockey. So we relocated to Maryland uh, from New Jersey. So I gave up my racing stable. We moved to Maryland, and just sort of looking for something to do part-time, I had been on a few racing shows, racing at the Meadowlands. They had asked me to be on as a guest, uh, a guest analyst a few times on their replay show. So I started working at the Maryland Tracks part-time as their in-house uh, television host. And then, as you said in your very nice intro, um, it sort of uh, led to ESPN hiring me to work on uh, the National Best 7, which didn't last long, but it was then overtaken by a new show that they started to uh, replace that, which was Today at the Races, which was on the air for several years. How did you go about honing your craft, having very little TV experience? Obviously, to be good at television, it's important to know what you're talking about, and the presentation is uh, pretty much what needs to be refined in a lot of cases. Well, it definitely needed to be refined on my end. I didn't know anything about live TV, trust me. Um, ESPN was very patient with me, and I sort of got thrown into the deep end literally on that show, The Best Seven, because we had seven live races from seven different tracks, and they would all go off maybe like five minutes apart, and we were literally flying by the seat of our pants. And, you know, if there was a delay at one track, it would screw everything up, and then the poor producer's trying to juggle, okay, well, we better, we got to tape this race and play it back after the commercial because you, you had to get every race in. Um, so a lot of times, you know, we'd have a format, but the format would kind of get thrown out the window after the first couple of races. 
So it was an interesting way for me to learn live TV, but I did have to do a lot of work on my presentation skills because I knew the sport, but I didn't know anything about television. Um, and ESPN has helped me quite a bit over the years with that. So I'm very grateful. Let's rewind just a little bit, Janine, and talk about the role of the between race analyst at the racetrack. And it's evolved and it's kind of um, gone different directions over the course of time. But to me, I think that person should be the most accessible person at the racetrack. How do you think the between race analyst can help develop the fan base? Well, I definitely think that the, the, the on-track host can be someone that the fans can connect with. And in a lot of cases, that person should be the face of that racetrack. Um, and it's, you know, a recognizable person where, you know, if you're watching a signal from a certain track and you see a certain person, you know, oh, I'm watching Arlington or I'm watching Belmont or I'm watching Keeneland or whatever the case may be. And in that regard, you know, it, it would be great, and, and it is great because this is the case in most places where that on-track television host is a great conduit between the fans and, you know, the track itself and track management. And they're out there, they're visible, they interact with the fans, and a lot of times tracks will have, you know, seminars or uh, morning, you know, morning gallop uh, times for the fans to come out and the on-track host is a part of that. And I think that's a great way to bring new people into the sport is just to have somebody that the fans can relate to and connect with and can sort of educate them on the whole horse racing experience. How much of that job do you think is knowledge of the sport and telling the hardcore players something they don't know, being a fan educator and being a personality? Oh, gosh, I think it's probably equal parts. I mean, that's a great question. I think I think all three are very, very important. Um, but you mentioned, you know, the hardcore gambler. In my opinion, um, the, the on-track TV host is not necessarily going to tell the hardcore gambler something they don't already know. Most handicappers have their own system uh, for watching races and for, for handicapping the races. And they know how to get the information. And I've had um, several newer uh, on-track handicapping people contact me for advice. And the one thing I tell them is try to give the fans, the viewers, something that they can't get themselves in the program or the racing form. If you talk to the trainer, if you talk to the exercise rider, if you were out in the morning and you saw the horse breeze yourself, any little nugget that you can give them that is not something they can read, that makes their ears perk up and that gets them thinking and that gives them a little tidbit of information that they can use. So I, I try to tell people when they ask me for advice, I try to say, you know, put your reporter hat on. It may take a little extra time and a little extra work, but even if it's right before the race in the paddock and you go up to a couple of the trainers and ask them a few questions, at least you're giving first-hand information and something new that the audience can then take and do what they want with. And that piece of advice, I would guess, would transcend to what you currently do at ESPN as a sideline reporter, talking to people, giving people behind-the-scenes information that makes the broadcast better. And let's talk about your early days at ESPN, Janine. How do you transition from being a horse racing expert and kind of having a defined role in that regard to doing college football and basketball? Was that something that you pursued, or was it something that you were kind of thrown into because you were good at what you did? Well, I think maybe it was a little bit of both. I think I had expressed an interest in branching out and doing other things. And I think ESPN was interested in trying me on some different things. Um, so they were definitely receptive to the idea. Um, but it was difficult because, you know, I went from reporting on a sport that I had so much in-depth knowledge about but not only that, but I had great relationships with so many people in the sport that I could get a lot of information that I could use on the air. And when I first started doing college football, I had none of that. I had never covered a football game. I didn't know any of the participants in the sport and didn't know any of the teams. 
and you're flying blind and you're, you're just starting from scratch. And unfortunately, what usually happens is when you start something like that, you don't get any training. They just, they just say, here, we're going to assign you to this football game. And nobody ever taught me how to be a sideline reporter. Nobody taught me anything about being on a football field or how to prepare for a football game or to be, you know, where to be, when and what to do. And so I had to learn on my own on the fly. And, you know, I think those first couple of years, it was a little bit rough. <laughs> but. You do, you know, you do develop, each sideline reporter kind of develops their own system and their, their way of doing things. And you find, you know, trial and error what works best for you. Well, Janine, you were a jockey, a trainer, a horse racing TV analyst. Now you cover college sports where the testosterone levels are through the rough. You are <laughs> a sweetheart by nature. Did you have to learn to be tough? I'm not always a sweetheart, but thank you for the compliment. <laughs> But, you know, you do, you do, you do learn to develop a thick skin. You know, you really do. Um, I think part of that comes from when I was, you know, very young, I was always very skinny, really, really, really skinny, uh, abnormally skinny. And I was picked on and teased, you know, most kids are teased about something. And I think that's where I started to get a thick skin is to just kind of tune it out. Um, and when then when you work on the racetrack, also you've got to have a thick skin. I mean, back in the '80s when I was on the track on the backside, um, there weren't a whole lot of women. There are a lot more women than there are now. And now what I do, I'm surrounded by men. I mean, I'm definitely there's only one or two percent of us on any crew that I'm on at any time that are women. So it's it's fun though. I don't mind being around the guys, and they they usually treat me pretty well. Well. As viewers watching SportsCenter or watching all the different broadcasts on ESPN, we kind of get to know the personalities through how they present themselves. But who are a couple of your favorite people to work with? In terms of on-air people? Yeah, or... on-air people or yeah, people that we would know as viewers, as personalities that, you know, they portray a certain image on the air and they may be the same or they may even be different uh, behind the scenes. Okay, now, so I'm, I can only go by ESPN people, really, because that's, that's really mainly who I know, although I know several of the NBC folks because I've worked with them on, NBC, uh, on ESPN. Um, I mean, some of my favorites, obviously, Joe Tessitore, Randy Moss, uh, Kenny Rice. I've worked with all those guys on horse racing shows on ESPN over the years, and what you see is what you get. Um, Joe Testor is your quintessential Italian, hot-blooded, um, loves food, loves good clothes, uh, works his butt off, and will do anything for you. Um, as are Kenny and Randy, they work their butts off as well. Uh, Kenny Main, Kenny Main is unique, the one and only Kenny Main. Um, his personality on the air is actually, I think, toned down a little bit from what he's like in real life, because he's... He's pretty funny. He he's a pretty funny guy, and uh, love being around the guy. He's just he's just a hoot. Um, gosh, there's so many there's so many people. Um, you'd be surprised how hard a lot of on air people work behind the scenes for days or weeks ahead of time preparing for an event. I think that's one thing that the viewers probably don't realize is we don't just show up and talk and, and we're just on the air, you know, or prepared like the night before or whatever. We're working for days and sometimes weeks in advance on a particular event. It's a lot of work behind the scenes. Now, Jenny, we're in the midst of the Triple Crown season and any horse that wins the Derby and the Preakness goes to the Belmont having to run nearly four miles at three different venues in five weeks. Now, other sports tweak their games in an attempt to make them better. Even college football is going to institute a playoff system here. When it comes to horse racing, what are your feelings about tradition versus change? I personally like tradition. Um, I don't think that the Triple Crown should be changed in any way because I think that would do a disservice to the 11 horses that won it um, in its current format. I think what's changed over the years um, are the breeding patterns, the durability of the horses, um, the way that they're trained, um, the different therapeutic medications that they're given. I think that has all contributed to 
a less durable resource and let's face it we have 20 horses in the derby every year now i mean it's it's the best horse doesn't always win the derby although this year I'm, i think he did uh, I, I think that that all plays a part in why we haven't seen a Triple Crown winner. And who is your favorite horse of all time and why? Oh, gosh. Oh, there's so many. There's so many. Well, I should probably just, I'm, I'm in my office here, which is all horsey stuff. And right here on my on my bulletin board here, if this, if this might give it away, can you see this? I can. This is... This is Zenyatta. Remember this? I do. Breeders' it, Cup. Like, this is on my bulletin board. <laughs> I think she. I think she might be, just because of what she did. Mm -hmm. I never forget working that Breeders' Cup at Santa Anita when she won the Classic mm -hmm. that year. Um, it just gives me chills just to think about it. And even her Classic the year after that at Churchill, where she got beat. I mean. I just think it will be a long time before we see another horse like that. And she had so much personality and so much charisma and her connections. You know, John Sheriff and her owners, the Mosses, were so accommodating to the media, to the fans, to everybody. It was just the perfect combination of the perfect horse um, at the right time. And, and I think that's why I, she has a special place in my heart. Now, from horses to people and all your days of horse racing and now sports, Based on their personality, who have been your favorite people to cover? Oh, gosh, there's, oh, that's a tough question because there's been so, so many over the years. Um, ooh, boy. Is that's, there a particular story you've done for Outside the Lines or any of the other ESPN shows where you've really felt, like, good about finishing it and good about the story? Well, the, the the one story that that will always be the most memorable and the most meaningful to me, although not necessarily a feel good story, um, but it, it's it, it had such an impact, and I was so heavily involved in it because I, it was in my area of the country. But um, Barbaro, mm -hmm. you know, it was um, something that I covered from start to finish, uh, literally to the very end. And uh, it, it that really that was a tough one. I mean, even now I'm getting tears in my eyes thinking about it. It was just it was one of those stories that will change you forever. And he had such an impact on so many people that um, I I've gotten asked that question quite a few times. And uh, that will oh, unless something really earth shattering happens to me and I cover some world changing event or whatever. Uh, that will be the story that will probably stick with me for the rest of my life. Now, given the heartwarming story about how you met your husband, Oklahoma State defensive coordinator Glenn Spencer, there was a role reversal of sorts there, Janine, because instead of covering the story, you were the story for a while. What was that like? <laughs> well, yeah, it was it was different. It was it was different. It was um it was, you know, it's one of those things that I think there's just um, a higher power at work. You can't explain it. It was meant to be. That's what we feel. Um, because there's no way that our relationship could have happened and endured. Um, you know, we were friends first for months and months, just talking on the phone once in a while and living 1,100, 1,300 miles apart, how that could blossom into, you know, oh my gosh, this is, this is really amazing. And then we ended up getting married. Let's see, we got engaged in February and we were married in July. So I don't, my math is horrible. What is that, like four, five months? Five months. Um, five months. Yeah, we had to get married in July. This is, this is typical because of our work schedules. Uh -huh. <laughs> Because he was getting ready to start, you know, fall training camp, and he's right. like, well, you know, I'm not available after this date, and uh, and I'm not available because I'll be working too, so if we're going to do this this year, it's got to be now or never, so, um, but yeah, I still have my house in Maryland, but I have moved to Oklahoma, and so I'm talking to you from lovely Stillwater, Oklahoma right now. <laughs> there you go, and well, we got to get those... Uh 
the the Oak City Thunder back on track. I know exactly. Yeah, but how about Kevin Durant winning MVP? I mean, it's yeah. just, that speech, amazing. Yes. One of the <laughs> yeah. best sports speeches I've seen. Yeah, I got to give a lot of credit to him for crediting all of his teammates. Yeah, and that, and that brings me back full circle, kind of to the sports realm once again and ESPN has such a great partnership with uh, horse racing over the years but the coverage has kind of dwindled as the years have gone by what do you think horse racing can do to become more relevant in the eyes of the mainstream networks oh gosh you know that's the million dollar question and I think that's a question that the sports kind of been wrestling with for a while now um it's, it's difficult because there's so much competition out there for the entertainment viewer and for the recreational uh, minutes that people have. Um, and horse racing is unique. It, you know, it really is a niche sport. And I think that the NTRA and America's Best Racing are doing really all they can do right now with great initiatives, you know, with the ambassadors and trying to reach out to new fans across the country and the initiatives of um, trying to make the sport safer for the horses and for the jockeys. I know it's an uphill battle and there's a lot more work to do. Um, I, I just wonder if there's a way somehow that racing could try to partner up with some other big major sporting events and kind of piggyback um, to kind of get people, you know, if there's, um, I don't know if there's a big event going on in Baltimore with the Orioles. Uh, you know, I know they have tried that where they have had their media party at Camden Yards and, you know, um, gone to an Orioles game. But I'm just wondering if there's a way to kind of partner up with some other major sports to kind of get some crossover with fans. Because racing is a great sport. You just got to get the people there, you know, and that's hard sometimes. Well, Janine, besides your work, and you have a great job, obviously, you love racing, you love covering it, now you've fully engulfed yourself into other sports and doing great stories, what makes you happy? Very simple things, really. <laughs> Taking my dogs for a walk, uh, or a hike, um, or riding my horse, or even just going to the barn and piddling around and, you know, giving my horse a bath, things like that, that's, that's what I find relaxing. Um... Or, you know, watching, I know this is going to sound like I can't get away from it, but watching a great football game on TV, I like that. Um, like doing yoga. Yoga's very relaxing as well. But I, I would have to say probably spending time with my husband, my dogs, or my horse would have to be the top three. Now, working in mainstream sports, and we've talked about different areas and relevancies of that why do you think more athletes that have disposable income don't get involved in the racing game we have some we have coaches we have some players that are involved but these guys have money to spend horse racing is an ego trip everyone wants to try to win the kentucky derby why do you think more coaches and more athletes themselves don't get involved in ownership you know and everybody loves a good ego trip including me. So, I mean, I, I don't know that. I don't know what the answer to that. I think, you know, I think the Kentucky Derby folks um, and the Barstable Brown folks who are heavily involved in bringing a lot of the celebrities to the Derby, they do a great job of exposing celebrities, athletes, singers to racing, get them there to, you know, on racing's greatest stage, the Kentucky Derby, and have them experience it. They go down to the paddock, they see what it's like, and there are, like you said, a lot of athletes that are involved in horses. I just wonder if it's something where um, it's not always immediate. The rewards are not always immediate. And I think we live in such a fast-paced society, and especially people that are involved in sports are very type A, and they're used to things kind of happening at a very fast pace and, you know, instant reward, instant results. Horse racing doesn't work like that. You know, you can buy a horse, and, oh, the next thing you know, oh, he needs 60 days off. You know, he's got a chip in his ankle, or, oh, he has a fever. we got to miss this race. Or you have a horse primed for, you know, for a really good effort, and... He gets left at the gate and he comes in third. You know, things happen. Um, I think 
once you would get people involved in ownership and if they had a teeny taste of success, they'd be hooked. But my, my personal opinion is that sometimes it just, you need a lot of patience to get through. It can be kind of a frustrating experience at times, horse ownership. Now, for aspiring broadcasters out there, what kind of advice would you give them if they wanted to climb the ladder of success that, that you've climbed over the years? Oh, gosh. I got very lucky. Believe me. it's um, I happened to be in the right place at the right time, and I got very lucky, and um, I credit a lot of very talented people that have helped me along the way. Uh, I would say keep keep working at it. Keep making contacts. And the most important thing in being a journalist, really, is is developing, honing your writing skills, um, keeping the writing as sharp as you can possibly get it. And and even if you have to practice, you know, writing a 40-second script, try to trim it down to 30. Try to lose as many unnecessary words as possible, and it will have more impact. That's the one thing that I will say that I learned that has helped me the most, and it's really the most important because if you want to be a, an effective storyteller, being able to write concisely and with impact is probably the most important thing. And then just working on your delivery, you know, which, you know, anybody can get better at. Well, Jean, this interview has hit the home stretch, and I've saved the best for last. Uh-oh. If you were me conducting this interview, what question would you ask Janine Edwards? What would I ask Janine Edwards? Oh, my. That I haven't asked you already. Oh my, oh my, okay, um, tell us some fun things that you are most looking forward to doing when you get to Baltimore for the Preakness. Tell us some fun things that you're most looking <laughs> forward to when you get to Baltimore for the Preakness, Janine. <laughs> well, okay, you know, going down to Inner Harbor, I haven't been there in a while. Love going to Inner Harbor. Um, the alibi breakfast and eating that delicious fried chicken that the Maryland Jockey Club puts out. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, they always put on a great show for the uh, for the draw party. You know, they have a great little cocktail hour thing there. Um, and uh, just being back in Maryland and seeing all my friends and the hospitality there is second to none. Um, and there's a, there's a neat little place called Cafe Han, um, which is on, I believe it's off of Falls Road, which I usually hit that place at least once for a meal. It's, uh, down home cooking really good stuff. So I, I'd say those are the things that I'm most looking forward to. And I had a nasty stomach virus while I was at the Derby, so I didn't get to do uh... anything. So I am hoping that I feel better, which I do by now, but I'm hoping that I can at least have a little bit more fun at the Brigness than I had at the Derby. And what about an impressive victory by California Chrome heading into uh, three weeks later when he would attempt to be first triple tr crown winner since 78? Is that something that you're looking forward to seeing potentially? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you know, the last time we had a shot, of course, with I'll have another, you remember how that ended up, and that was just so heartbreaking on that Friday uh, when he was scratched. So I would love to see that happen again. I love the whole story, love the connections. It's just, it's a made-for-TV, you know, it's a movie. It's a movie. Um, so I, I, would, I would love to see that happen, and that would mean that I would get to cover the Belmont Stakes. So I'm, I'm really... Fingers are crossed for that, definitely. Well, Janine, thanks so much for sharing some of your valuable time with us. Before we let you go, any final thoughts on the future of horse racing, what fans can do to best enjoy the sport, and, uh, you know, sharing your love for it in general? You know, I would, I would encourage fans to take a weekend and go to Saratoga uh, or take a weekend and go to Keeneland or – if you have a weekend in the winter um, and you're heading down to Florida, go to Gulfstream. If you're on the West Coast, go to Santa Anita. Take some friends. If you want to pack a picnic lunch, do that. Um, if you know, if you're of drinking age, you know, have a, have a couple of drinks and just sit and have some money that you set aside and say, this is going to be our entertainment money today. And don't go to the track thinking that you're going to hit it rich and you're going to go to Vegas and you're going to, you know, win the lottery. You're there to be entertained and to enjoy a breathtaking sport. 
and just go with your friends and have fun and soak in the atmosphere and soak in these beautiful athletes and maybe you'll win a few dollars. It, it's, it's an incredible experience. Believe me, you will not be disappointed. For America's Best Racing.net, I'm Joe Christofek in the spotlight with Janine Edwards. Janine, thanks a lot. Thank you, Joe. It was great.